Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're honored to sit down with Jordan Gitterman, a founder of Item Bank. Thank you so much, Jordan, for joining us today. Justin, thank you very much for having me here. Could you please tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what your focus is, and then also a little bit about Item Bank? Sure. Uh, I am currently involved in in the commodity business. I've mostly been involved in in hard assets, uh, real estate in the past. Um, now I'm involved in some gold mines some in Australia and maybe some more here in, in the States. And also cryptocurrencies in particular in Item Bank, a first of its kind global parity valuation engine, which we'll define in a few minutes. Um, and so Item Bank is, is still a startup, but it's a 20 year old project. And so, you know, you just ask me where, what direction you want me to go in, and I'll be glad to tell you more about it. Yeah, well, you know, I want to kind of get into some of your background. I know you um, have a deep experience in commodities, but Item Bank is quite a unique um, idea. And also, I was unaware that it had been around for 20 years. So if you could kind of explain to your listeners what Item Bank is and how it's unique. Sure. Uh, I'll start with the genesis of the project itself. And I have a partner, uh, Virginia Robinson. Uh, she and I were, are traders, uh, direct traders, you know, barter, sometimes known as barter. Where she was trading in exchanges, I, I always uh, shun those exchanges. I kind of view the exchanges similarly to banks, um, somewhat disingenuous. And so she was trading these different products and everybody in in the barter industry knows that hard goods and it's so true today like toilet paper for example always have value and will always um, be wanted you know so she she was trading mostly building supply materials which always are needed and wanted but yet in the united states in the 1990s late 90s uh, they were not selling, and so she was bringing them to Jamaica, but Jamaicans, for the most part, didn't have the cash. And the average Jamaican, let's just say, was making 500 Jamaican dollars a week. They'd run to the bank to get out of that currency and to get rid of those Jamaican dollars to get into the U.S. dollar. And let's just say they were getting 250 U.S. dollars after all was said and done. Um, and they, you know, in general, Jamaicans didn't have money, but in general, Jamaican hardworking people, in fact, it was a, um, do you guys remember the Wayman brothers? Anybody who ever saw that, those, um, the comedy show, they used to have a skit that Jamaicans, you know, they worked and they had five jobs and they were always working, but, and it's somewhat true, you know, stereotypically Jamaicans do work very hard. And so they're always producing and they were producing many different products, but one in particular is coffee. Uh, they had an abundance of what most Americans would find a premium coffee. And so she was able to trade, directly trade, building supply materials such as flooring and doors and uh, windows to, to the Jamaicans who really needed these products, but they didn't have the cash to buy them. But yet they had these products that they can trade directly for them. And so in doing that, she realized that there was misinformation or the currencies didn't have information. They just didn't have the information. They weren't smart enough to have it. And so she is somebody who studied, Virginia Robinson had studied uh, money and became uh, studied economics and studied money, history of money. She's very interested in, in the depressions that occurred and how people lost everything because of currency failures. And she realized that if you're able to to make these exchanges, these direct exchanges without money, the transactions are fair and they they're not costly per se. And so anyway, so I was um how I met Virginia is an interesting story. I was living in Chile and I had a cop of mine there and the banks were killing me on uh on exchange rates. And they're very, very sneaky. You go to the bank and they ask you, do you want to pay a, a fee? Of course, you don't want to pay a fee. And so you don't pay the fee, but then they like just rob you more on the exchange rate and their hidden fees. And 
and I was going crazy. I'm like, you know, I was following Bitcoin early on. I watched how much it went up. I was was pretty busy, you know, in, in the mining business, have the copper mining getting chilly. So I didn't really have that much time, but I'm like, you know, I got to get into cryptocurrencies. I got to get out of this banking system. It's, it's, it's so distorted and crazy. And so when I, I eventually moved back to, to the States and moved to Florida and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get into, into the cryptocurrency business. I have to learn about it, but I was targeting the barter business because it's a, a business I know well, and the barter communities have uh, been using virtual currencies for the last 50 years. And I'm like, you know, in the crypto world, uh, there's always the the word disruption. So I'm going to disrupt the barter businesses because I don't I didn't like them. Like I said earlier, I thought that the barter exchanges are very sneaky, like the banks are too. And I want to disrupt them. And so I started to uh, to work on doing that and worked on one currency and eventually was introduced in Virginia. And she told me um, about her idea, which is Item Bank. And which is really basically tokenizing uh, basic human needs and using those basic human needs to come up with the best valuations. And, and so I, she didn't, she was working this for years, like I said, since the 1990s prior to, to blockchain. And when I met her, I said, well, why don't we tokenize it? And you have those values there and you use uh, the blockchain really for what it was set up to be used for as a financial marketplace and offer, you know, people transparency and offer them, you know, all the things that a good blockchain should have, like, like Bitcoin's blockchain and, and some of the other ones. And so she, that's what she wanted to do. And so we've been working on it. I've been working with her for about two years on this and um, it's still in the startup stage, but we're getting close to going to, to market. So that's our, that's how the project uh, started. And that's kind of where we are now. And so to understand further, um, since your audience is very familiar with gold, it's, and this is a really good example, you know, the, the dollar is currently many times used worldwide, the U.S. dollar, because it's the reserve currency of the world to measure the value of things. And probably most of your audience knows that the dollar has lost a lot of its value. So, you know, you, how can you use that to measure other, the, the other, other items, the value of them, including other currencies even, if it's losing value of the dollar? So like a meter is always a meter, a yard's always a yard, and never changes. Well, that, that's, they're good for using for measuring uh, things because they don't change, it's a standard. And the dollar really is not a very good standard. Whereas, if you look at this example, where gold throughout history an ounce of gold would pretty much buy a man a suit and some accessories like shoes and a belt, and maybe a tie. And so a hundred years ago, that's what would happen. One ounce of gold would get a man a suit, shoes, maybe a tie and a belt. And gold at that time was $30 and $30. You could buy the same thing. You could buy a suit and you could buy the shoes and, and the belt. But today, Gold will still get you those items. One ounce of gold will still get you that. And so let's say, I don't know what gold is today. Do you know, you know what gold is today, Justin? Uh, it's been pushed to 1700 I think yesterday it was at its highest price since 2012, which of course is a year in which it reached 1920 per ounce. Um, and currently we're looking at gold uh, 1650 And these are, I mean, these are, gold uh, is an interesting story here because um, it's quietly shown really encouraging price action for investors it's it's shown it's shown strength in for many months but it's a 1650 right now so you know for 1650 bucks right you can buy yourself a, a nice suit i mean you can buy a 1200 suit an armani suit a 13 1400 suit even and you can buy shoes and you can buy the whole the whole you know whole outfit and you could do that 100 years ago for 30 bucks uh, but why is gold 1650 today, right? Because the dollar keeps losing value. It's, infl it's inflated, and they keep taking the value you know, away from the dollar itself. And so the dollar really isn't a suitable measuring stick. You know, you can't really measure other items off of a dollar. And so, in using basic human need items that 
items that everybody uses and, and not just using gold, but gold is gold. If you had to use one item, that'd probably be gold, but probably gold is very, very manipulated. And it's always, you know, there's it could always be a problem with using just one item. And if you use a hundred items or even 50 items that every human needs, such as a t-shirt, such as, and, and we, we break these items into five categories for the basic human needs. We break them into five categories, which are food, clothing, shelter, and medical and hygiene supplies, and paper, paper goods, and some plastic goods. But paper goods like toilet paper, which is, you know, I see a lot of jokes today about toilet paper being used as a currency. But we're, we're planning on doing exactly that, using these basic human needs as a currency. And you can do that by tokenizing their value today. And you couldn't do that years ago. And if you use a, a, a basket of them, you can get the best relative valuations. And for those who have heard of purchasing power parity, you can think along lines of that. And I'll explain that quickly what it is. And many times it's called the Big Mac Index. And if you were to purchase a Big Mac here in the United States for $1, and you purchase one in Mexico for two pesos, the equation would say, hey, $1 equals two pesos. If for some reason it went up to three pesos, you'd have to say, hey, what happened? Did the peso lose value? Or did the dollar gain value? Or was there a problem with meat maybe in Mexico where they couldn't get meat to the market or something? You really wouldn't know. But if you used a, a number of different items, you could really get the best value of the dollar versus the peso, and also the peso versus other currencies around the world and, and the dollar, the same thing. And so that's what we plan to do is make um, different indexes off of the information we get. And um, that's the real utility of what we're doing, actually. The other thing is to bring these basic human needs to market by offering a, another market for basic human needs by having retail warehouses where producers, traders, and manufacturers of good quality, basic human need products, you can bring your t-shirts there and you can get credits. And those credits would allow them to trade for other basic human needs as people maybe brought um, a payload of, uh, of, let's say peroxide or alcohol and somebody else maybe brought in some clothing and someone else brought in building supply materials into the warehouse and they had credits they can trade them. And those credits will be fungible because people can redeem them for these different products. And then eventually we get into another currency, my friend, and everybody else out there, as we gather the information by smart contract on these different transactions, the information itself has value. And then you have an information currency. So it's a lot of information I'm throwing out there. So ask me some questions, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, I've been thinking a lot about recently the nature of money and particularly the nature of money in a free market. And I don't imagine in a truly free market, a circumstance in which one single agreed upon form of money uh, takes shape or form. Instead, rather, I can only like imagine that in a, some, a community in which there is no uh, fiat currency, that is money by decree, there would only be a select few items that kind of float up to the top as the type of medium of exchange that people accept readily. And in, in this circumstance or in this thought experiment, I imagine like mostly pretty much a barter system. So could you kind of discuss uh, the nature of money as you, as item bank views it, uh, the history of money as well, and why you are tackling uh, barter particularly? So this, at this point, it even goes past barter. Um, but a lot of the principles of what we're doing, um, they come from barter. Um, and barter is very, you know, it's very pure. I mean, barter is how, uh, the barter exchanges started here in the States about 50 years ago. But barter direct trade has been going on for you know years and years. It's probably the, the earliest form of commerce was is barter. You know, yeah, I trade you know, a couple of these items for those. You know, here in the United States, uh, we traded uh, we the the um, the Dutch who came over traded 
you know, beads for land. The Indians had a lot of land, so to them it wasn't any big deal. Um, and they wanted those beads, and they wanted, you know, the different trinkets that the Dutch had. So it's been, it's, it's, that's how economy, you know, used to basically go. And then eventually gold became um, the de facto currency, and it really is. Gold is, is real money. Um, the history of money is, you know, it, it comes uh, really, I think, from trying to have a medium of exchange, exchange that you can store value, you can store work, your work, your efforts, and you can use it at another time. So when you went to make an exchange, if you didn't have the exact item that somebody needed, but you have what they needed, you can take their value, you know, and that would be money. And you can use it as a, this type of a credit at another time. And gold and, and silver and precious metals became the, the store of value. Now, gold is, uh, you know, I can go into a long history in gold, but for those who are ancient aliens, perhaps humanity was um, spawned because of gold, right? The Anuki, a an alien race came down to, to earth and they wanted gold and they created mankind, you know, and that is in different lore. It's in the Zulu law. I think the, it's in the Sumerian law. It's in the, I think the Indians write about it from the Indians from India, but I think the Mayans write about it too. So perhaps that's true or not, but that's what humans have been writing in years and thinking about for years. So gold has always had that value. Um, and it's always been a, a holder of value. And when you say gold is doing very well today, it's not that I think that gold is doing so well. I just think that the other currencies are doing so poorly. Gold is holding its value. That's its job. Um, it's been doing it for years, and it's doing doing it again today. You know, when in this chaotic market. I know you have a lot of experience in the commodities market. Could you kind of describe your experience in the commodities market and? Discuss a little bit of the commodities overlay today. What comes to mind for me is uh, oil and gas prices currently have been uh, quite low. I've heard people in the precious metals uh, market discuss that silver could be kept low because oil is at such low prices today. But I'm curious, could you tell our listeners uh, a little bit about your commodities background as well as what indicators you're looking at today in that sector? Sure. So I was in real estate for years. Um, and for those of you who watched the movie, the, the big short in the, in the early two thousands, <clears throat> late in the, in the 1990s, there was this condition in, in, in the real estate markets where money was pouring into the markets and it became a free for all. And I saw that real estates were becoming very overvalued. And in fact, you know, we came very close to, you know, we had a housing market crash. We we basically had a systematic crash in in two thousand and eight, two thousand and seven, and so that's when I started to really want to get to get out of real estate and get into producing commodities. Uh, I ended up in Colorado and Kansas. I was living out there, and I was drilling oil wells. And then from there, I eventually got into mining, into the mining business, and I was down in Chile. I was producing copper down there. I was involved in several, several of the mining deals, an iron ore deal in Mexico. Um, I was always on, on gold, and eventually I got into the gold business. And um, I'm involved in uh, some mines in, in Australia, which we're just getting to market now. They also have an iron ore component to them, which we, they're just starting to produce. And acquiring some gold mines, hopefully here in the States. Um, as far as what, you know, what I think right now, I think silver is undervalued, right? There's different ratios between silver and gold and silver is, the ratio is completely out of whack. Um, I'd love to hear what you feel or what you're hearing about why silver is down because of oil. Um, that's, that'd be interesting. Um, you know, oil is, well, what happened to the oil markets, you know, it's pretty interesting how it just fell off the cliff. But, you know, if the whole economy falls off the cliff, I guess oil is going to fall off the cliff, too. And then, of course, you know, Russia and, and Saudi Arabia are producing more and more. And 
kind of funny. The United States is telling both of them to stop producing so much, but I don't see us, the United States, saying, hey, we're going to produce less either. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But I, I am interested to understand what um, your thoughts are on silver being, its price being depressed because of oil. I think the general thinking goes, and this is just something I've heard kind of uh, from my wholesalers in the gold and silver industry, is that with silver, with gold, oil prices so low, that they don't see some of these other commodities markets rebounding so quickly. Um, and the lower that oil goes, the more downward pressure there'll be on other commodities, including silver. And that's um, essentially the line of reasoning that I've heard from certain people. A more compelling uh, line of reasoning I've heard regarding silver prices currently comes from activity in the futures market. I think JP Morgan and Citibank uh, and other banks have long been uh, accused of manipulating precious metals markets and particularly the silver market. In fact, the Justice Department in September of last year called the JP Morgan Metals Trading Desk a criminal enterprise. That's the uh, that's Justice Department words. And they were investigating manipulation in the silvers and gold market, uh, particularly, particularly the futures market. Now, if you look at the open interest in the futures market for silver, you see that over the last nine years, the, there's been about 200,000 200, to 225,000 uh, shorts opened. And in the last uh, several months, that has creeped downwards towards 135,000 open short contracts uh, held by uh, on the COMEX. And if you look at the 2011 price rise in silver, when it went from, um, I mean, it started in 08, 09, it was around nine bucks. By 2011, it had reached uh, nearly 40 or nearly $50 and then collapsed. During that price rise, the number of uh, open shorts in the COMEX was about 135,000. So right now we're down to about 139,000 open shorts on the COMEX. And I, it's more compelling for me to look at the correlation between the open interest in the futures market and the price of silver. And a lot of the more compelling arguments I'm hearing about where silver could go from here are coming from the fact that these shorts are, are being dwindled down by the the bullion banks essentially right now we're at right now we're at levels that we haven't seen in terms of open short interest since 2011 so well you talked about manipulation and going back to item bank it's exactly the reason why you use a basket of goods instead of just one good because you know, you can start manipulating it, and it's not just this one particular um, case that you just mentioned with J.P. Morgan. Um, I think Deutsche Bank with with gold a couple of years ago, they were like called out big time. I mean, it's it's these metals are widely manipulated because they can be, and so they're you know they're doing it, and it's it's harder to manipulate a basket of goods. And maybe a few of them could be manipulated, um, and maybe a few of them could somehow be giving off the wrong values somehow, you know, but if you have a whole basket of them, it kind of evens out and you get the right valuation. So that's, that's what item bank is, uh, is that, but that's quite interesting what you're bringing up with the silver. Um, I think eventually uh, silver and gold will realize their correct values and manipulation will be somewhat rooted out as, you know, people are going to have to fill these shorts. They're going to have, you know, they're going to be called in and gold, um, I think they've been keeping gold down for some time, meaning meaning the banks, the central banks, and they're just not going to be able to do it. You know, as you know, we're pouring trillions of dollars, and I think every other currency that can be printed is printing like crazy at this point. And th th these currencies are, I think, the people are losing value in them, are losing, um, I'm sorry, confidence in them, and so. There's not too many places to go, um, right? We were just we're talking about the fact that people are, can't pay rent right now. So what is that going to do to real estate? So you can't really run to real estate right now with your money. Where are you going to preserve your wealth? It's, I wouldn't put my wealth in the stock market right now. That's pretty shaky. I mean, like a couple companies in there, but in general, I wouldn't do that. So where are you going to? Where can you put your wealth? 
you know, I would, and your, and your savings. And even if it's not that much money, just where do you preserve your value? So I would, I would gravitate myself personally to, to precious metals. I mean, that's what they're historically noted to do. And that's uh preserve value. That's what they're, that's what they're for. And this is a time to, to do that. And I would also go to alternative currencies um, that are not centrally controlled, you know, cryptocurrencies, even, even, you know, they go up and down and they're volatile, at least you have the freedom to use them and, and use them in different markets. And I just, you know, the U.S. dollar could be used almost anywhere, but a lot of the other currencies can't be. They're just very parochial to certain countries and you can't use them. So at least in that Bitcoin, you can, you can use it almost anywhere. Yeah, it's going to swing up and down. But I would say that um, as these fiat currencies start losing value, Bitcoin will maintain its value and probably go up. And some of the other better currencies, cryptocurrencies, will do the same. We talked about a little bit about uh, kind of manipulation in the metals market. And oftentimes in the Bitcoin industry and the cryptocurrency industry, some of these future markets, these sophisticated uh, uh, tools that are being uh, floated to the CFTC by the either the Winklevoss twins or other organizations such as uh, the CME, as well as Six in Switzerland, are heralded by the community as like progress. But I look at these a little bit more cynically and view them as tools to manipulate the price of uh, cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, I personally agree with you and i'm you know the the one of the other purposes of item bank and it's another way of stating it is to root out speculation and to root out what speculation does and sort of you know one of the one of the problems with bitcoin is although it's not centrally it's decentralized there are what's known as these whales and they and if they come in and they start playing with the futures, I agree with you. There are ways to to manipulate it. But even with that said, the the utility of Bitcoin won't go away. And so I, you know, that's why I think we'll keep its value. Whereas the utility of the of the dollar could evaporate as people just don't want to take it or use it. And um, there's a there's a great article that a friend of mine wrote, um, the backwardation of gold. And eventually what happens is the gold holders won't take dollars. And when that happens, you know, the dollar fails at that point, basically. It's a terrific article. I'll send it to you. Um, Please do. Whereas I, I think that gold holders wouldn't mind holding some Bitcoin because there's the utility of it. You can use it. Now, gold is, um, is going to have you know, more utility, too, as I see more and more models coming out where it can be used off of a credit card and then your gold could be sold and credits, you know, the gold cash should be just transferred to somebody else. And it's so gold will have even more utility coming up. But, you know, going back to item bank again, not everybody has gold, not every community has gold, but every community does have some of these basic human needs, which again is clothing and, and food and stuff like that. And so they'll be able to, to have a, way to tokenize those values and trade them and use them and, and survive. And eventually you really don't need an intermediary fiat currency because you could, if you could tokenize the value of your real estate, if you could tokenize the value of these basic human needs, if you could tokenize the value of, of gold, the fiats that we have today don't really, their utility is, is nothing special to say the least. All these other products are fungible and they're able to to be to be used on a daily basis eventually. And so that's what I think I think that's where we're heading. Now somebody said that the really poor people will be using fiat and people who have you know have some money, right, will will be able to use tokenized assets. And another thing I read recently also was is regarding the definition of money. When you kind of asked me what my thoughts were of money and the history of money. Well, currency and money have different, many different definitions when you read about it. But 
currency is the dollar bill. It's the, the paper. At one time, it was backed by gold, and gold was the money behind it. And so we don't have money anymore, really. It does, it's not a store of value. That's one of the, the definitions of, of it, of money, is being a store of value, being a unit of measurement. It really fails there, as I talked about earlier. So really, we don't have the money backing our currency anymore. We just have the fiat currency. The money is the gold or in a tokenized asset, the token, the, the virtual currency, that, that's, the, that's the currency. The money behind it would be, could be the real estate. It could be the gold. It could be the, the clothing, the, the toilet paper. It could be all those different things. And that's where we're heading, um, unless someone stops us from heading that way. <laughs> that's where we're heading, and I think that fiats will be more and more maligned and not used. I mean, who who would want these? Who'd want to hold dollars? You know, I, I saw recently um, Max Kaiser from the Kaiser Report because why would any? It's a crime. He goes to trade Bitcoin for you know a debit coupon, debt coupon that's losing value. You know, basically. So I can see, like, uh, let's say that there is some sort of reset in the precious metals markets where they break free of this uh, kind of. Um, this range that they have been manipulated into going back to your earlier point that gold isn't increasing in price, but rather it's just holding its value in comparison to lesser assets or assets that are decreasing in value, whether that be via perception or money printing or otherwise. I see that when these metals do reset and they break out of these ranges and silver goes to say a hundred dollars as Bill Murphy suggests is entirely possible. He, envisions three thousand dollars quite easily for gold i can see that being a result of a revaluation of the fiat currency itself something similar to like what we've seen maybe in mexico where when the peso collapsed in the early 90s and they reissued a new peso and that new fiat was given a new value by decree from top to bottom in that scenario then we can see how the precious metals then would be would break free of this range that they have been in over the last, um, I mean, quite a while, 10 years, we'll, we'll say, but really this kind of goes back longer. But for simplicity's sake, we'll kind of look at this range of like, uh, say like gold, $900 to like 1920 and uh, silver from like, uh, let's call it like, uh, say like, I'll go down to like 12 bucks, 1250, all the way up to $50, that range. Then there's the reset. Silver all of a sudden starts trading at $100 and perhaps more and around there. And gold's up at around three thousand. Many people say five thousand dollars. I see that as a direct result of that. We've been given a new valuation for the U.S. dollar by decree. Right. Well, yeah. I, I mean, by decree, by decree, by decree of who? Of the of the Fed. Pretty much the Fed. Yeah. Let's say like the U.S. dollar like uh, um, fails, and we need to reissue like a new dollar, basically. But is it going to be backed by anything? Who's going to start accepting it? I mean, when Mexico and, and Argentina has gone through this, I mean, a lot of countries have had to um, to reset and, and start again. But the dollar, you know, it has a very unique place in the world as being the, the reserve currency of the world. Is it going to maintain that? I mean, a lot of countries are not interested in that right now. I think over the last six months, of virtually every leader has come out and said they don't want to to keep it this way. They don't want to, you know, trade in dollars. The BRICS are now trading directly with each other. So, and um, that that, that, that would give happens. rise to the revaluation. Yeah. So I'm not saying that after the revaluation happens, the United States would still be a world reserve currency. That I, I'm rather saying that that revaluation would have to happen because the U.S. dollar is no longer the world reserve currency, and people aren't taking it. Yeah. Perhaps um, then the world reserve currency is either a basket of currencies. Perhaps the International Monetary Fund is issuing a special drawing right of some sort. Right. Yeah, no, 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 you're right about that. I think that's what will probably ha have to happen. Um, and I think, I think, I hope that the market just prevails. Again, you know, if you're a purveyor of foods, now, if, if, if it's a fiat currency and it's mandatory that you use it, right, which the dollar is in the United States, you basically, you have to use it. And, of course, we're, 
insisting other countries use it also, the United States is, um, as a lot of the world doesn't really per se want to use it anymore, we're pretty insistent upon them using it. Um, I think as that breaks down, and if you're selling food, you have to take the dollar, would you take it? No, you wouldn't take it. So it's a, it, it could be forced upon the population like it is now and like fiats are around the world. Most countries, you know, force them. I think much of the population is starting to really tire of that because there's so many examples of them failing. And now that, you know, we have alternatives, we have ways of tokenizing gold. You can use gold in a, in a much different way. So I think people are going to attempt to, um, I'd hope they would for them for their own preservation would attempt to use those virtual currencies that are backed by real hard assets and you know preserve their value because I think the same thing will just happen again if you have another fiat right historically speaking, most fiats last thirty years right we're at about fifty years with the dollar being a fiat, so it's pretty and that's I think that's the most anyone any any that's lasted, as far as I know. I saw a chart recently kind of uh, mapping out how long recent empires have lasted. I mean, it, this chart included like Portugal, Britain, um, the United States. Those are the ones I recall off the top of my head. And the U.S. is certainly kind of pushing up against that, that longer time frame of how long an empire kind of uh, is able to, to exert influence over the rest of the world or or have the world reserve currency kind of moving on i I, unless you had another comment but i did want to kind of get down get moving on to current events this is something that i know you've been following closely so i guess uh, so um i guess uh, what's it like in florida right now what's the feeling and uh, i mean are you under lockdown and and what's that like Yes, we're we're under the lockdown. Uh, from my perspective, and also coming from New York, and it's uh, important to say this because I hear the reports out of New York, and there is a lot of people being infected. They are being hospitalized, and people are dying. And as um, horrendous as that is, the numbers don't seem they seem to be flattening in New York. They had the most uh, fatalities yesterday. It seems like the the virus is flattening, um, and so what I'm what I'm seeing is we've pretty much decimated our economy right now in, in the United States and much of the world. You know, they just locked down India. India is one fifth of the world's population. They're on lockdown. I spoke to a friend earlier from the Ukraine. They are they can't go out to lock down. And Florida's like that also. And um, how are people going to? survive. I don't know. I think that the cure that is being spread around the world is going to be much more onerous than the virus itself. So I I think that we're in bad, bad, bad shape. Uh, There might be alternative reasons why this was put out, you know, such as the fact that uh, we're talking about money, how the dollar has been how the financial system has been been boosted uh, by the repo market and now now by this huge stimulus. Um, perhaps that's the, the reason why they, they needed a cover to throw all this money into the market because it was falling apart. So I, I don't know. I, I think that the the cure that they're bringing out is much more onerous than the actual virus itself. And you look at a country like Sweden, I don't know exactly what their numbers are, but it seems like they have a much more sensible way of handling this, which is the people that are really at risk to really, you know, to they must isolate themselves and, you know, others others need to go to work. But, you know, I spoke to a woman who, who who's a cleaning woman, and she goes, I have enough money for this month, but then next month she doesn't have money. And then what happens? How does she eat? What does she do? What do her dependents do? And all these these questions go unanswered. And we've had illnesses and pandemics in the past, and we have never done such a thing. 
and I don't think anything like this has happened ever. Now I read I, somebody had a quote that it's the first time in history that we've quarantined healthy people. It's normally the the ill or those that are very susceptible susceptible to becoming ill that have been quarantined. So I'm I'm in lockdown basically because I have to be. I don't I don't like any of it. I don't enjoy it. I don't agree with it. Every area is a little bit different. Maybe maybe in New York, you have to take much more precautions because you know, it's a very dense area and it is spreading there. But uh, in Florida, we are we are getting cases of it. Um, in the community I live in, there's a couple that both got it. And uh, because again, I am from New York and that is the epicenter of this. I hear cases uh, all the time. So that, you know, the virus is is real. Um, I do think that categorizing virtually everything as coronavirus, whether it be the flu or pneumonia, it's just coronavirus now. And um, you know, I just hope it passes quickly and everybody remains safe. But the economy is really hurt, and there's going to be a lot of people that are hurt financially. And I just hope we don't see people actually starving, which you know, if this lasts a couple more weeks, it could happen. You know, from a, kind of taking a step back and looking towards the future, I think it is like so important for people to take as good care of their bodies as possible so that we do not get into these situations again. Because I think that the, uh, the main comorbidity in general of all death is probably a lack of health, a lack of understanding of health. I read a, uh, I was on a website, the Center for Advanced Medicine here in uh, in San Diego, California. I was seeing if they were open. Google says they're closed. They say they're open. I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe they just are trying to like uh, limit the foot traffic into their store. But uh, I'll read a quick quote on their website, and I, I think that this really hammers home the importance of us like understanding what the like root cause of of not sickness is, but of health. Like, what's the root cause of uh, health? And uh, they say basically, um, quote. The majority of our chronically ill patients show up toxic and dehydrated and they don't know it. Choose to know. So, you know, like from a big picture perspective, I hear everyone discussing like, oh, how are we going to like organize uh, technocratic responses in the future? How are we going to manage these global pandemics in a global manner? And first of all, I'd say we've managed this global pandemic in a global manner. We've seen global governance unlike ever before implemented and uh, executed upon. Uh, but the real question is, like, let's get to the root cause. And I think the root cause in a lot of cases is a lack of health and the lack of um, understanding of what good nutrition is. And that's really how we kind of stamp down this uh, disease now, quite frankly, and uh, any in the future. Uh, that'll give you the best, that'll give us the best chance to keep the numbers down and the parabolic graphs from spiking like they like they seem to be doing so that we don't get these responses that quite frankly do a ton of damage. You mentioned the, the woman who doesn't know how she's going to pay for uh, rent, food, et cetera, moving forward. Uh, I mentioned a study earlier that, or, or you had mentioned the study here on this podcast of like one third of Americans apparently didn't pay rent this month. What are the cascading effects of that on landlords, et cetera? But also I'm, I'm curious about like, the lack of concern for the people who are living like literally like every two weeks to two weeks that that paycheck on the first and 15th, I mean, come on, this is like a, a embedded cultural concept that like people are waiting for the first and they're waiting for the 15th because they need that money um, to make ends meet. The lack of concern for those people who are not only in the United States or, or rather not, perhaps not a, perhaps the are less likely to be in the United States than say in, in the Southern hemisphere is I think quite racist in a way. I think that we're, nobody's thinking about what the, the effect of a lockdown in Benin, Africa is where they don't have a social safety net and those people are living in slums. They don't have clean water. They um, like potentially could be thrust into starvation due to these economic lockdowns. There's no discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody cares. That no one cares exactly. I mean, and it's it's absurd. I mean, what you're saying about the population has to take care of themselves. Everybody has to take care of themselves. You know, their answer to the who and you see Bill Gates is running around 
um, now. And their answer is they want to vaccinate everybody. That's the answer, Sam. And the answer, with, you know, while you say that, like, I, yeah. so doc, this Dr. Burks, who um, I believe that she's like received a ton of money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She's also, her daughter works at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Fauci, I believe, re- received a hundred million dollar grant from the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And like, I mean, is that not a conflict of interest? Anyway, go, go for it. No, I mean, you, you have to say these things because people, they don't talk about this on television. They don't tell. And you're, we're just blasted by, you know, by no, no one on TV is saying, hey, this is how you take care of yourself. You take a lot of zinc. You do you, These are the things you need to do, you know, and you don't see that. You just see, you know, yeah, let's vaccinate everybody. That's what you see. Just... Everyone has to, like you said, they have to study on how to how to maintain your good health. It's part of it. Like it should be studied by yourself, and not certainly not by the government who made the whole country obese. You know, when I was a kid, there were no fat children. If, if somebody was overweight, it was very very rare. I grew up in the seventies; nobody was fat, and it was it was an aberration when somebody's fat. The whole country's obese because, you know, the centralized authorities came out with a food pyramid that they should have turned it upside down pretty much. And they made a whole fat country. And the food itself is not very nutritious. It's uh, mostly fast food. And people are not, ha- they're just not healthy. And putting a bunch of unhealthy people under this kind of stress it only makes things worse. You know, so, and, you, know, they're not, you know, the centralized authorities, I'm not, I'm not really not allowed to go outside. Um, I was yelled at by a police officer. I was the only one in the empty freaking field. <laughs> the guy's yelling at me. I was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting sun and exercising. But, you know, you weren't supposed to be there, so I left. And you read these stories all over the place. And, and the same thing goes with money. You know, the time has come for, for I think, for people to to really have to grab their own lives and take control of them and it's, it takes a lot of responsibility to do that but that's what we need to do because depending on on these authorities to give us all the answers is it's not going to work and i i don't trust the conflicts of interest you just mentioned and i i i know about them and you know you read about that and you really pause and you go wow is that really true yeah it's really true it's really 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 true and um, Bill Gates is the second largest donor to the WHO, to the World Health Organization. So I just don't really feel comfortable with this group of people telling me I should do the following thing. So I don't know what others think, but uh, you know, I think you and I think the same way. Yeah, and I think so, a lot of people who, who don't agree with us would say like, oh, you don't care about the old people. Well, I mean, like just to be clear, I have a grandmother who's in a nursing home right now. She's locked down without any visitors, without any sun, without any social contact. And in my opinion, other than we are FaceTiming, she's learning FaceTiming and whatnot. And in my opinion, like at her age and advanced age of 90 years old, locking her down in a bedroom uh, without visitors, with a door shut is – is potentially just as damaging to her health as letting her go out or maybe see her family. I saw a story of a grandma, a 101 year old woman. I don't know if she's a grandma, but 101 years old in Germany escaped from her nursing home through an emergency exit and was detained by police. She was on her way to see her daughter. And I, I mean, this woman like survived world war two. This one, I mean, for actually let's back up. She, she survived the, I mean, if she's 101 years old, I mean, she's born in 1919. So, like, Germany wasn't in good shape after World War I. And then we got the Weimar Republic, where there's somewhat of a, like, cultural renaissance there. But the 1930s, then, she survives Nazism. She survives the Cold War. Like, who are we? Like, we have no idea what this woman survived, and here we are trying to protect her from herself, essentially. Yeah, she this she, she survived the currency collapse. <laughs> she survived, right. She survived all these things. And then we're, it's... Look, it's it's insanity, and and the people themselves have to take control of as many things as they can. Of course, there will always be central authorities, but you have to have alternatives, and there are alternatives. There's alternative 
currencies. Um, there's there are precious metals, which for the most part are can be outside of a, a centralized run um, authority. They have vaults that are independently run, and that's really the way to protect yourself. People need to go out and start gardening and growing their own food. I mean, food is going to skyrocket in price. It's going to be really interesting when food starts skyrocketing in price, and so does gold. Um, then you'll see, then that's how I think you can judge the value of gold, right? How, is it buying you more basic human needs per ounce or not? Is it buying you more food or not? Because those other items are going to skyrocket in price compared to the fiats. And then you'll see, you know, how, how Bitcoin does and other, what I would call legitimate cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies that have a real utility to them. We'll see how they fare also. But as far as, you know, the, the current events, I mean, we have to take as much control of, of things that we can and, and just hope that and, and work together to stop um, this type of centralization. We may be outgunned. They, I mean, they have on the media, they had such a successful blitz with this that they've taken away almost all of our constitutional rights. People are pretty much begging them to do that. I hope it's helped. I don't know how much it has helped. I've seen doctors say that we really should not be doing that. And then you watch what Sweden's doing. That would be a real good indication of does this social distancing and closing the economy help? And it doesn't even talk about the cost of it because, again, if everybody's out of business and the economy collapses and people are freaking starving and halfway homeless, is it worth it or not? You know, so I, that's the question I keep posing. Most people answer emotionally, like you said, like you don't care about old people. And But it's a, it's a yes and no type question. Is it worth it or not? I say it's not worth it. I say it's just not worth it. And to add to that, like my father is a, a security guard in a hospital here in San Diego, which he says has been a little bit quieter than he expected. But like the other day, he told me where I could find his life insurance policy. So like, I'm not sitting here saying like, oh, freedom, economics, because like I have I, an ideology. It's because I I think that there's two types of people, those that are looking at the numbers and the figures and the real ones and and blocking out the noise and those that are kind of being taken away in this movement and you know i think americans should kind of like it's almost as if we're at war we should be kind of familiar with this technique of war which is shock and awe i mean i think that we implemented this similar sort of philosophy in iraq early on that was the term they use and like what i see is that we've seen kind of like this shock and awe push in a way uh coup d'etat and there's going to be a pushback eventually once we kind of uh i, I think we're already starting to see it yeah, I mean, in economics, they use um, speculators, you know, when they're, when they're trading. Well, one of the things that they use to make their decisions is emotion. And so we have to root this type of emotion, I think, out and make rational decisions. This is a, a hysterical behavior that they've got everybody to agree to. And those that don't agree to it, like I've read recently that the Philippines, some Filipinos are, are – they don't have food. You know, they're, they sort of stay in your home. They run out of you know, food, run out of money. They're not allowed to go out. And they started to protest and their government said, hey, we're going we're gonna to shoot you. You know, I mean, that's not, what are they protecting them from? You know, there's, they're, they're going to shoot them. And that's Africa, funny, yeah. I forgot that what actually happened. Is. That happened yeah. somewhere. Somebody got shot for not wearing a mask. This was, yeah. uh, this was like in Philippines or something, right? In the Philippines, well, they, they were going to shoot them because because they were protesting um, without a, a permit. But they were told they're going to have food, and they waited two weeks to say, you know, we can't take this anymore. You know, I'm sure the neighbors are, are sharing food to a degree. but and, it, and that just goes to show you that. And that's why I really I hope that this economy can be revived and that people do have the opportunity to, to reflect on this and say, you know, something – we really all have to prepare and look at preppers who many people scoffed at in the past and say, you know, these people know what they're doing and start to prepare, start growing your own food. You, you may not have much money, but put what you can into precious metals and into some alternative currencies that can be used and 
really prepare for this to happen again because the next one is going to be the one where I just think everything falls apart. I think, I think, and I'm, I'm hoping that the economy will be revived. We can go back to some sense of normality and it will give everybody a chance to regroup and to prepare for what's going to come, which is eventually it, it's become quite apparent. The, the system will collapse because it's not, it's not sustainable and they're just keep on using the same methods to solve the problems that caused the system to be in the position that it's in. And so it's only making it worse and worse and worse. And it's exponentially worse, worse because we just printed $2 trillion. Uh, I think under a decade ago, uh, maybe it, when Obama first took office, thinking there was only $8 trillion in dollars out there. And that is, you know, who knows how many trillions, 20 some odd trillion dollars now. I mean, that's it's pretty, uh, pretty steep curve. If you look at it that way. And I just want to make an issue a correction. The man who was uh, shot in the Philippines for, he was like told to wear a mask and then he attacked people with a, a blade of some sort. So, I mean, that I was wrong there. Obviously, though, the yeah. panic, the panic uh, kind of resulted in this situation in and of itself, um, but certainly like it's not a good idea to wield a, a weapon. However, I did see a, a funny video of a, a man in Australia outside of the uh, Chinese embassy like with a whip. Now, look, I think that ideas like are what did Mao say? Like he's not scared of a gun. He's scared of ideas or something like that. But anyway, uh, Thank you so much for joining us today, Jordan. Jordan is a founder, a co-founder of Item Bank. Where can people find you, Jordan? And do you have any kind of uh, comments in conclusion? Uh, sure. I think that that Item Bank is geared for just this type of a situation where the systems are breaking down, uh, where it's geared to help the common man and community and small, smaller producers and producers where they don't have to just rely on, for example, Amazon. And eventually it will bring producers directly in touch with consumers, even, even bypassing per se Amazon. And that's um, really where I think things can become powerful. I think if people uh, band together and work together that they can overcome much of the problems that we have today. You can find us at www.itembank, and bank is spelled with a C, so it's I-T-E-M-B-A-N-C dot N-L, like Nancy Larry, and that's where you find us. And I look forward to hopefully talking under better conditions because right now it's um, – it's very worrisome for many people, and people really are are starting to run out of money. So I hope you know very much that they open the economy again, and I pray that people you know remain safe. And everyone has to take care of themselves and do what's best for themselves. And that might mean going to work, and maybe wearing a mask at work, or maybe not. But you know, people have to make those decisions themselves. Um, and I hope that they're not going to be forced to stay home and starve. So it's getting pretty dire in many areas of the world. And I think in the United States, it's going to happen soon because I hear people saying that they can't pay rent. We, we said earlier, I think a third of the people are not paying rent. And it looks like what's going to happen to our society if no one is able to, to pay for services and people will stop providing services. And it's just a, a complete decay of society. So I hope that that can all be averted right now and we should all learn our lessons and, prepare because if we're going back to the same system, it's only on shakier grounds and we all need to, to really prepare. Thank you so much, Jordan, for joining us today. And uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening and definitely take care of yourselves. I think that, you know, I feel pretty, I guess, lucky and excited to be able to think for myself. I think that that's pretty cool. Justin, I agree with you, and I really um, appreciate you having me on, and love to talk to you again.
Likewise, definitely. We'll, there will be better times ahead, Jordan. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And thanks everyone for listening.